my four siblings were entering into the, the world of rebellion and, and drug abuse and alcohol abuse and immorality. So in a very real way, as a youngster, I was discipled by my siblings. And so that created within me this sense of, I, I'm going to anesthetize my pain by using the world. And yet my mom came to Christ and that changed everything. As my mom began to pray for us kids, the Holy Spirit began to move. I went to my parents' house and I saw my mom and I went up to her and I said, Mom, tomorrow I'm giving my life to Jesus. And she goes, what? <laughs> I said, tomorrow I'm gonna give my life to Jesus. I sat on this bench in the back of the church as far back as I could go. And I said, Jesus, here's my life. I've made a mess out of it. And if you can save me, here it is. Well, Pastor Greg, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, it's been a long time coming. Yes. Uh, we're grateful uh, that you're going to be sharing your testimony with us today. For those who don't know you, who maybe have never seen you, could you introduce yourself to those who are watching? My name is Gregory Ivan Zetz. I'm the senior leader here at King of the Nations Church in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, I'm married to a beautiful woman named Margie. In fact, in April of next year, April 7th, we'll be married 40 years. We have five children, three girls, two boys, and we have five grandchildren as well. And so I've had the privilege of leading a congregation now since 1997. I've been pastoring in the Maryland area now for over 35 years, um, and I've learned a lot. And one thing I've learned is God's grace is amazing. I wasn't born a preacher. I wasn't born a pastor. I was born a sinner, but I was a I was a big baby, so I I, I was a big sinner. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was the youngest of five, and my mother was 41 years old when she gave birth to me, hmm. October 26, 1961. I came out 11 pounds two ounces. My father joked because back then when a baby was born, they'd put them all together and the father and family would come and look through a window and my dad declared over me, he's going to be a football player. Look how big he is, you know, and I did play football for a while. But, you know, my story is a story of, of really of supernatural beginnings because I say that because every, every person born has a supernatural beginning. The very root of our, of our creation, our conception reveals the love of God. It's supernatural. I remember I joked with my mom. My mom passed uh, eight years ago in 2015. She was 94 years old. And I'll get to my mom here in a, in a few minutes. But uh, I said, was I planned? And she just laughed. I said, well, that's my answer. <laughs> but though I wasn't planned, God had a plan, a purpose, and I was the purpose of God, and I was conceived, and I was born there in October of 1961. And, and as I grew up in this Catholic family, I grew up uh, with really a longing to find out who God was. And I, I was a Catholic, I was an altar boy, but what happened is that there was a misrepresentation of the Father's heart. And that's what I was in search of. I was in search to really know the Father. And so my father was raised by an alcoholic. My father said the happiest day of his life was when his father fell off a roof and died three days later. Wow. My father was 12 years old. So raised in that environment, uh, uh, was, was a, it was a traumatic environment. It was a house of mourning. My dad was one of 13 children. And so eight of them died in, in childhood or in birth or whatever. So he was one of five. And it was a house of mourning. And so my dad was raised this, in this environment, meets my mom after World War II. They get married. They start having children. And my father doesn't know what to do. He was raised by a disciplinarian. That's all he knew. And so as, as I say to people, it's not always what our, our fathers did. It's what they didn't do that impact us. So in my heart, I, I, I felt rejection. I felt abandonment. I felt that I wasn't valued. And, and so consequently, growing up, I was looking for significance by trying to please my father. I entered the, the world of sports. I was very good as a baseball player, football, football player, quarterback, pitcher, all of these things. And my father would never affirm me. 
And so, a very long story made short, I begin to rebel against my father, against my mother. I begin to, as, as the youngest of five, my siblings, my four siblings were entering into the, the world of rebellion and, and drug abuse and alcohol abuse and immorality. So in a very real way, as a youngster, I was discipled by my siblings. And so consequently, I began to open doors to darkness. I began to open doors to, to pornography, the perversion, to, to even, even as an elementary uh, student, um, drinking my brother's beers when they, when they weren't around. And so that created within me this sense of, I, I'm going to anesthetize my pain by using the world, mm -hmm. by using uh, drugs and immorality and alcohol and all of those things. And so there was a there was a deep deep void in my life, and yet my mom came to Christ, and that changed everything. My mom had a personal relationship with Jesus, and she began to learn how to pray. She began to learn how to seek God. She began to see her her sons and daughters as objects of God's love, though they're in darkness. She had the authority to pray and intercede. And my story, really, it, what I want to highlight today is, is two things. The, the power of intercession, and, and the second thing is the pursuit of the Holy Spirit. And so it's, 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 a, it's a dynamic that is so, so powerful. So as my mom began to pray for us kids, the Holy Spirit began to move. As I uh, realize and meditate on salvation and people getting saved, it really is, at the end of the day, a love story. And so here I enter my teenage years. I have a full-blown alcohol addiction. I'm squandering time. I'm squandering opportunities. I'm in junior high, going into high school, and I'm just, just uh, being a fool. You know, I'm being very foolish with my life. And, and the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the destructive work of darkness was penetrating my life in ways that I didn't even realize. And so my mom's praying for us kids and interceding and, and doing all, all those spiritual disciplines to see the breakthrough come. And at the age of 17, when I graduated from Rich Montgomery High School in 1979, I said, I got to get away from my mom. And, and Pastor, really quick before you move from there, when, when your mother gave her life to Jesus, mm -hmm. for you, from your perspective, what was different? Like, you know, from oh. the before and the after, oh. how, was, how did the home change for you? Well, she was walking in depression. She would say to my sister and I and the rest of the kids that were there at the time, uh, I'm going horizontal. And what that meant was, I'm depressed, and I'm going to go sleep. And my father was a teacher at Gaithersburg High School. He was always gone. He was always uh, in meetings. He was, he was absent. And when he was present, he was still absent because hmm. he couldn't connect at the heart level. He, was, he didn't have an example. He didn't have a father that says, this is how, how you love your children. So there was no demonstration of love. So my father, in a, in a very real way, um, checked out. And so the pressure came upon my mom. So in 1971, when my mom had, was born again, that depression and that hopelessness and that anger that she walked in. My dad had a vicious temper, but my mom did as well. Hmm. What we noticed was, wow, she's more patient. And how old were you at that time? Uh, I was 10 years old when my mom got saved. That was wow. 1971. Wow. And that impacted my life. I won't take the time to talk about that, that part of my life because I did have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I saw the movie The Cross and the Switchblade, and it changed my life. When I experienced the Holy Spirit in, in 1971 when my mom got saved, and I saw the movie The Cross and the Switchblade, and it, and it cut my heart. All of a sudden, I was bombarded by all this spiritual attack. I found pornography in my, my parents' house from my brothers. Um, I got exposed to perversion from a, from a guy in, this, in, in, in school. So I was exposed to a, a great deal of immorality very quickly. 
And and what that shows me is I just reflect on that season is that it's kind of like Joseph when Joseph's brother said, here comes that dreamer, let's kill him. Mm. And I believe that that the devil saw an incredible call and potential. And so all of a sudden I'm being attacked by numerous specific temptations, being bombarded with things that were drawing me away from Jesus. I got hurt in the church. I got hurt by a youth pastor. There was a great deal of control. So I reacted to all of that. That catapulted me into a life of addiction. And just to clarify, Pastor, so at 10 years old, your your mom gives her life to Jesus, mm. is born again. Yes. You, ha- you had an encounter yes. with the Holy Spirit through the cross and the switchblade, the yes, movie. the movie, the and, book, yeah. And then from there, the the warfare, there was warfare or yes. attacks that came in yes. your life. Yes. Um, and then you said at 17, well, the rebellion came in. Yes. Um, and you were mentioning that at 17 is when you wanted to, to, to check out. Yes. Take us through that. What? Well, I graduated June 18th, 1979 from Rich Montgomery, and, and I was very uncomfortable. You see, the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will come and prove men guilty of sin. He's like the prosecuting attorney. And so through my mom, through her love, for, unconditional love for me, through her uh, standard of righteousness, that is Christ's righteousness, she was creating a, a nest for the dove, the Holy Spirit, to be in our house, mm-hmm. and I did not feel comfortable. And so it exposed me, it exposed what my heart was like, it exposed the fact that I was separated from God. So I moved out, I moved into a townhouse, I found an ad in a paper. And, you know, the sinner's way is hard. You know, the transgressor's road is very hard. So what I was doing was I was opening a door for to, to create conflict and chaos in my life through my independence and through my rebellion. So the darkness increased, the alcohol addiction increased, trying to find meaning in life uh, was, was a constant pursuit. But yet the Holy Spirit is setting me up in this love story, he always pursues what's valuable. And in this love story, he began to convict me. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about what he did. Um, I had a 1971 Plymouth Fury. It was yellow. It was bird poop yellow, we used to call it. It was a tank. It was fast. It had a 383 engine in it, posi traction in the, in the, in the rear. And I would drive that around like I was a big time operator. I had my girlfriend sitting in the front seat, and and I had I had big speakers in the back, and you could hear me coming from you know a hundred yards. And and I remember one day, I'm, I got the radio on. I'm drinking a beer, and and that was a daily routine for me drinking, you know. And I found my reputation in it. My reputation was Zets can drink a lot. Greg Zetz can outdrink anybody. And I so I found myself as the one who had a reputation and I felt secure in that reputation of being a partier. I was the guy that always drove. I was the one that drove back from the bars in DC because everyone else couldn't handle the liquor. You know, so I, there was pride in that. I I felt I felt significant. I felt important. How sad. How sad that is. So I remember one day I'm driving. I remember right where I was. To this day, I remember turning on the specific street, and a song comes on by Styx. It was a good band. It wasn't my type of rock music, but I listened to it. And the, it went. this song called Fooling Yourself played, and this is the lyrics. And you're fooling yourself, and you don't believe it. You're killing yourself, and you don't see it. Why must you be such an angry young man when your future looks so bright to me? How can there be such a sinister plan that could hide such a lamb, such a caring young man? Hmm. And And the song says, get up, get up on your feet. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I was alone, and the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, that's you. And I turned the radio off. (laughs) <laughs> so the Spirit of God is using a rock song to convict me, to show me where I was. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Spirit in the love story of pursuing what's valuable, He shows us where we are. And He showed me right where I was. And I turned it off, and I got so angry. I was trying to shut the voice down. 
about a year or so after that, I was 17 when that happened. When I was 19 years old, I was in a bar that I used to frequent every single day. I would drink, work all day. I had always had a work ethic. I'd work all day. I'd stop at the bar. I'd go home and shower, stop at the bar, and spend my evening there, throw darts. And I had friends, so-called friends. One night I was in there, and I was drinking with a man called we called the Colonel. He was a colonel in the Marine Corps. He was at Iwo Jima. This was a bad dude in his younger days. And he was an alcoholic. And I was a teenage alcoholic. When I, when I took the alcohol test with 20 questions, I answered 18 out of 20 questions. I was an alcoholic. I was bad, <laughs> you know. And that addiction would have just grown and, and ultimately killed, taken my life from me. So I'm in there drinking that night. And the Holy Spirit, I'm buzzed a bit, okay? I'm a little intoxicated. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and said, look at the colonel's eyes. I heard the voice of God. It wasn't audible, but I heard it in my head. It was captivating. It grabbed my attention. It was. It seized me, I, but I felt safe. And the Holy Spirit said, look at the colonel's eyes. And I looked at his eyes and I saw darkness and I saw death and I saw loneliness and I saw guilt and I saw shame. I saw regret. I saw all of these things in his eyes. And to this day, it's so clear to me. I can still hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit said, go in the bathroom and look at your eyes. Mm. And I, and I turn and by this time, I'm, I'm sober. I lost my buzz. It's like, it's like there's a conversation going on. The, the whole bar is moving in slow motion. And I'm having this conversation with the Holy Spirit, but I'm not saying anything. I'm just obeying his voice. Look at the colonel's eyes. Go in the bathroom and look in yours. And I went into the bathroom. I still remember looking into the mirror and I saw darkness, and I saw death, and I saw despair, and I saw shame, and I saw guilt. It was like the diagnosis of the Spirit of God showed me where I was, and it was love. In, in the context of being raised in the Catholic Church, and there are many Catholics that know Jesus that are born again, that are walking with the Lord, but in the, in the context of the, of the church, I, I felt like God was either sad or mad, and he was definitely mad at me. He was definitely angry at me. But that night in that bar in March of 1981, the Holy Spirit was saying, I love you. <laughs> I love you. I'm showing you the condition of your heart because I, I want a relationship with you. I don't want to live eternity without you. <laughs> And so that freaked me out, and that was in March. And so the Spirit of God is, is, is pursuing me and, and making me so uncomfortable, stripping me of my pride and exposing me of my heart, what was in my heart. And that was very uncomfortable. I remember uh, in February of 81, coming back from D.C., I'd, I'd been drinking all day, driving my fury my buddies are with me and they're all intoxicated. Two o'clock in the morning and I get pulled over. I don't talk about this very much. I get pulled over and I'm like, oh no, city of Rockville police officer. So I get pulled over and they're asking me for my ID and, and all of that. And he, they, you know, they said, have you been drinking? And I said, oh, I had a few, you know, I had a few six packs. <laughs> and he goes, would you step out of the car? And another cop pulls up and goes, he's got a concealed weapon in his car. And I go, I do not. And he goes, check underneath the seat. And they pull out my, my club, okay? And I had a club underneath. There wasn't a gun or anything like that. And they confiscate that. And it was, I thought for a moment, how did he know that I had that under, under my seat? And it was really, I believe, God intervening and exposing my lifestyle. So... The cop says, we're going to give you a standing sobriety test. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, I never had one of these before. And I was was under the influence. There's no doubt about it. And I sat there, stood on one, one foot, touched my nose perfectly. I'm like, this is stunning. <laughs> this is amazing, you know. So 
So I believe God in his mercy intervened. I didn't get a DUI that night because nine months later he would know that I would be working in a, in a nursing home and I needed my license and a clean license to drive the van and take the, the residents to their doctor's appointments and all of that. That's just God's mercy. Hmm. And, I, and, and, and I just want to bring that out because I saw the mercy of God throughout my whole life. I went to school with a, a, a guy, and, and he, he was drunk one night and fell off a bridge and drowned. I mean, I saw classmates die because of sin, because of rebellion. And I look back now and how merciful God was driving back from D.C., from partying on a Saturday night with one eye open and, and praying all the way, God, get me home, <laughs> you know, and he heard my cry. And God's mercy just was all over my life. And, and the power of intercession that my mom lifted up, because what goes up must come down. And my mom standing in the gap for us five kids, and ultimately all five of her children got saved, wow. or got born again, and began to live for the Lord. My oldest sister's with Jesus. My oldest brother's with Jesus. I did both of their funerals. And uh, it's just it's just amazing testimony of God's mercy, and and yet when those last few months before I came back came to the Lord, there was this conviction, and I began to hate what I was doing. I had a girlfriend, and it was like I don't want to do this. I felt unclean. I felt undone. I I felt like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm an unclean man. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what the Spirit of God will do is He'll really reveal to us our true condition. I found myself saying to my friends, my drinking buddies, I don't want to go out. I would stay at home and I would drink alone. And that's not a, that's not a good thing to do either. But I was fed up with seeing sin. I was fed up with seeing destruction. I was fed up with all of that. I was very uncomfortable about it. So fast forward to March of 1981. It was a month later on April 12th. 1981, I showed up at a Baptist church. I knew about this church because my brother had visited this church, Halpine Baptist Church in Rockville, Maryland. I remember the day before, on April 11th, I went to my parents' house, and I saw my mom, and I went up to her, and I said, Mom, and I'd already started drinking. I said, tomorrow I'm giving my life to Jesus. And she goes, what? <laughs> I said, tomorrow, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And she goes, why don't you do it right now? I said, no, I've got some unfinished business. <laughs> and so, I mean, I saw tears in her eyes, but I think she was sensing, like, what's going on here? I don't know. She had a moment of doubt and unbelief. I said, Mom, I'm giving my life to Jesus tomorrow. I drank all day into the night, went to a college park party, came very close to getting in a fight. I had a friend that intervened. It was like the devil was pushing my buttons. Four o'clock in the morning, my friend Bruce is driving me home. And I looked at him, and his mom had gone to be with the Lord the year before. She was a prayer warrior, loved Jesus, went to the same church that I got saved at. I said to him, I said, I'm giving my life to Jesus. And he starts laughing at me. Four o'clock in the morning, and I, I'm drinking a beer. He goes, you're an alcoholic. He goes, you're not going to change. And I came this close to punching him in the side of his head because <laughs> I was so mad. And I threw the I threw the beer out the window. I said, Bruce, I'm going to call you tomorrow, and you're going to go to church with me. He goes, all right. So he drops me off. I get up early. I am still under the influence. I call Bruce up. I said, Bruce, I said, I'm coming by to pick you up. I said, remember, we're going to church today to give our lives to Jesus. <laughs> Click. <laughs> Now, now, Pastor, what, he hangs what, up on me. what what was going through your mind, though, as you, because you said it to your mom, you're setting it to your friend, but you're obviously living a, a different life. W what was happening there, like in you to say, you know, I'm giving my life to Jesus tomorrow? I felt this faith. Mm. It sounds like a paradox. So he's going to go drink. A friend of mine, it was his birthday. That's part of the unfinished birth, uh, business, you know. So I was just going to, like, drink one last time and go all out. And I went all out. And and But there was, there was something in my heart, like, no, this is it. I'm done. 
Mm. And, and from January, what I discovered later on was in February, my mom was on a retreat, and the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, put Greg on the altar like Isaac. And so she struggled with that. She said, the Holy Spirit spoke to my mom and said, you're praying out of fear. You're interceding for your youngest son, because my mom and I were very close. She's 41 when she gave birth to me. So I had a lot of personal attention, a lot of time with her. And so she imagined, you know, me driving off the side of the road, getting in an accident, getting in a fight, get, you know, so she was praying, motivated by fear mixed with love. And so the Holy Spirit said in February, put him on the altar. And when she put me on the altar, that set something in motion in the realm of the spirit. That's when I got pulled over by the police officer and I got a I got a ticket and I had to go to court and 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 that's when uh, uh, I lost my job with my brother. My late brother had a, a ceramic tile company and my drinking had gotten so bad that he was like, I can't deal with this. You're fired, you know. So that made me angry. But all these props that my life were resting on, they were being taken. And it was when my mom surrendered me, put me on the altar, something broke. Wow. And so it like it accelerated. My grandmother died in March and it impacted me greatly. I remember the night before she died, the day before early morning she passed. I pulled up at one o'clock in the morning in front of my parents' house and I wanted to go in in. This is amazing. I wanted to go into the house and, and ask my grandmother's forgiveness. Little did I know, at six in the morning, I would receive a call that she died in the middle of the night. Wow. So something was motivating me to reconcile and ask forgiveness and all of that. So the the power of intercession, it it, it was like this oppression started lifting off of my mind, and I'm like, what am I doing? It's like waking up. It's like, how did I get here? The decisions I've made, to the choices to, to walk in the lifestyle I'm walking in, I've been deceived. I am an angry young man. I am looking for the world system to anesthetize myself. And all of that was stripped off of me. The armor that the devil trusted in over my life was being stripped off of me. So I show up at that Baptist church. I remember it so well. Coming in, it was a big church. I sat in the back. This is the first time I ever went to a, to a church that wasn't Catholic. I'm wondering where the candles are. <laughs> I'm wondering where the priest is. And No, seriously, I'm wondering where the altar boys are. And I'm like, this isn't like the Catholic church that I go to. But there was something special. God's presence was there in that meeting. I don't remember what the preacher preached. It was the gospel. And I felt the Spirit of God. I felt the love of God. I felt the, the assurance that he wasn't angry with me. He was in love with me. Remember, this is a love story. And so I sat back there, and, and the service was kind of long, I remember. And he gave an altar call, and I, I'd never seen that before. And this guy goes running down, I, I, yelling out, I want Jesus, I want Jesus. Turns out that guy was a um, uh, uh, guitarist, and he played in a band, and, and he would frequent he would frequently play at the bar I used to go to on on Rockville Pike, one of the bars I would go to, and I'm like, I know that guy, and he ends up getting saved, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not running down there like he did. I'm not responding to the altar call. I sat on this bench in the back of the church, as far back as I could go. And I said, Jesus, here's my life. I've made a mess out of it. And if you can save me, here it is. And it was in that moment the Spirit of God met me, broke the power of that addiction. It was gone. I never drank again. I never drugged again. I had a girlfriend, and I was under conviction. And that week, I broke up with her. I knew the Holy Spirit had me then. <laughs> I mean, I, I was looking through a new lens. Everything looked different. Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me up out of that slimy pit, out of that miry clay. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. 
Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And, and, and that describes, that is my testimony right there. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. He brought me, he heard my cry. I was crying out. I didn't even know I was crying out. You know, I remember one night in August of 1980, we had to move out of the townhouse in Rockville. And I had been drinking all night. And, and I, was so, I was so angry at myself. I was angry at my father. I was angry. I was an angry young man. And I remember three o'clock in the morning, I pulled in front of my brother Johnny's house. This is, this is poignant. Very poignant. It's a moment. And when the Spirit of God is working through someone, it's such a beautiful thing. And I, he, for some reason, he was up. It was three o'clock in the morning. He comes out and he goes, Greggy. He goes, what are you doing out here? And I've been drinking. And I go, I hate what I'm doing. I'm so, I'm so angry at myself, John. And John's like, it's okay. And I remember he prayed with me right there. Mm. And I didn't give my life to Jesus in that moment. But these were, these were indicators of the pursuit that, that the Holy Spirit was directing towards my life. Here's my brother praying for me three o'clock in the morning. Somehow I drove home. And so I have all these little moments of divine intervention. A lot of times we don't realize that, but I see these moments of divine intervention. My brother's praying over me at three o'clock in the morning. He went inside and he said, my little brother, I'm going to let him move in the basement. And I did. And that was, that was part of the plan. It set something in motion. It was part of the entire strategy of the Holy Spirit to bring me to the end of myself. Mm. And I moved in the basement. And, and that, was, that was like an incredible moment of, of opportunity. And God was keeping me safe by living in my brother's basement. And so April 12th, 1981, you'll, you'll hear me oftentimes when I'm preaching, I'll say, I got saved on, and then you'll hear April 12th, 1981. And I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm trying to honor the Lord. And I'm trying to declare to people that I'm preaching to that if God can save me, he can save anybody. I spent five years doing prison ministry, cell block counseling, Montgomery County Detention Center, and I met people just like me in there. The Bible says the whole world is a prisoner of sin. And I know this, that if God didn't intervene in my life, if I did not have a praying mother, and yes, there were other people that prayed for me, but my mom, I believe, was the predominant intercessor. And she received the reward of her intercession, the salvation of her children. But I believe if there wasn't divine intervention, I would have died prematurely, you know, as a young man, or I would have ended up in prison. And, and you see, sometimes we need to think about what could have happened to appreciate what has happened, you know. And so that morning on April 12th, 1981, there was uh, an opportunity to hear the voice of God for the first time in my life as far as a directive. And there was um, an um, announcement made about going to Mexico, San Luis Potosi, Mexico, a missions trip to uh, build a church and do evangelism. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to go. I had my mom fill out the application that Sunday morning. Four months later, I'm in San Luis Potosi, Mexico for two weeks, and it's there. It's there in San Luis Potosi, 19 going on 20 years old. The Holy Spirit spoke to me about the call of God on my life. And if there's anything I, I can bring out in my testimony, it's this. Number one, if God can save me, he can save anybody. Secondly, if God can use me to serve and to minister, he can use anybody. And so there in San Luis, the Spirit said, I've called you to preach. I've called you into the ministry. I remember right where I was. I remember the boots I had on, the jeans I had on. And I just remember I was alone, and it was just a moment with the Father, and the Spirit spoke to me. And so I knew what I was called to do. The Holy Spirit says, I'm calling you to ministry. That's what I've been doing ever since. And so I've had, you know, I've shared my testimony to Muslims in Ethiopia. I've shared my testimony with Buddhists in Sri Lanka. I've shared my testimony many times as I've made 68 trips to Mexico. I've shared my testimony with Catholics in Latin American countries such as Mexico, Cuba, Peru, Colombia, 
Spain, Gaithersburg, Maryland. <laughs> uh, I've shared my, my testimonies with Hindus in India. And it's, it's a declaration of what God has done in my life. And again, if God can save me, he can save anybody. It's such an awesome, awesome revelation of the mercy of God. As I, even as I sit here today and I reflect and I think about the different stages of my life, it's absolutely stunning. Hmm. God's grace is amazing. It's absolutely stunning. And so, you know, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man, any woman is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed. All things have become new. And that day, that Sunday morning, everything became new. That became my home. I was discipled there. <clears throat> the call of the ministry was confirmed there. It's so important to have a local body that you're part of. I, I, I am where I am today because of community. It's so, so vital to have a voice in your life or voices in your life, to have leadership in your life. And God has, has just literally, in his mercy, used the body to bring me into the fullness of the call of God. I'm six, I'll am six. i be 62 in a couple of weeks on October 26th, and, and I feel like I'm at the beginning of the beginning in many ways. I've been walking with Jesus now for 42, almost 43 years. Wow. This, this season of, of being a grandfather is, is an amazing season. But even this morning, I was saying to the Lord, you know, Father, you're, 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 you've carried me all this time, and I, I, I want to leave it all on the field. I want to I wanna go for it. I want to make disciples and go to the nations and preach to the nations and leave it all on the field, as we used to say in football. You know, we, we're going to leave our game on the field. We're going to give it our all. You know, I, I don't ever want to look back, but when I do look back, it's out of gratitude and out of appreciation of what the Spirit of God has done in my life. God demonstrates his love towards us that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so my life is really a demonstration of what can take place if a man is surrendered and the Holy Spirit does the rest. Amen? Amen. Pastor, uh, just to take it back a little bit, um, you told your mom, <laughs> I'm going to give my life to Jesus you like that part, tomorrow. Don't you? <laughs> and you did. I did. <laughs> uh, what was her reaction to that? I, I, you know, it's one thing to say it, but then there's yeah. another thing to have an encounter she, with God. I remember the Sunday morning, I remember handing her the application, and I said, Mom, fill this out. I just said it like that, fill this out. And this is for the mission trip. This is for the mission trip to San Luis Potosi, my first trip to Mexico. And she, I think she was a little bewildered when I handed her the application. I said, I'm supposed to go to this. And I, I got to tell you something, my heart was was ethnocentric. I was an ugly American. I was, you know, like, trust me, I did not embrace the nations the way I do now. I mean, I started my ministry living in a row house with two African-American brothers. And I was not in favor of, of, you know, I would not have been in favor doing that in my rebellion and in my darkness, because I was very ethnocentric. And I had a bit of racism in me and prejudice. And But God changed me, man. I love the nations. I'll go to any nation he calls me to. I'm passionate about that. Jesus is the king of the nations. Re de la naciones. It sounds better in Spanish. <laughs> Amen. So what was uh, your uh, your mom's reaction? Um, as far as not, not even just making the decision, but then seeing you walk out. Like, what did that relationship look like in, in the life after Jesus? Oh. I, I depended on my mom for intercession. I remember preaching on Wink's radio in August of 1982, and I was living in D.C. I was in ministry, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to go to Bible college. I mean, it was, it was, it was thick. I mean, it, I knew that I knew that God was talking to me. And I remember I went to my parents' house, and I told my mom, and I just started crying. And I remember her laying hands on me and interceding and says, this is what God's called you to do. You need to do it. So she was, she was one of the most non-judgmental pe people you have ever meet in your life. But she had an authority. She had a cut to her. You know what I'm saying? When she spoke, 
by the Spirit, you knew you were in the presence of the Lord. And so she lived uh, all the way up until 2015 as my intercessor. That woman interceded. She was very prophetic. She had prophetic words. But the elation I saw as I began to walk my walk, it, it, it just, she received the joy of her labor, of her intercession. You know, she gave birth to five children coming into the kingdom. Hmm. And, um, that's pretty noble. That's pretty incredible. And I, I would encourage, I would encourage mothers and fathers, but especially mothers, who have a rebellious son, who have a, who have a drug addict daughter, I, I, whatever you can describe the condition. But I just want to encourage mothers not to give up, because prayer is powerful, and I'm, I'm really an example of what can happen when, a, when a mother prays, and. Um, it, it is absolutely amazing. So don't give up, Mom. <laughs> don't give up, Dad. Pray until the breakthrough comes. Pray until the burden lifts. Pray until you see your son or daughter come to Christ. And, and keep them on the altar. Because I really believe in the spiritual realm. When my mom put me on the altar in February on, in 1981 at that retreat, that really set something in motion. Mm-hmm. And you figure February, March, April, less than three months, I was surrendering my life to Jesus. Wow. And remember, she started praying for all her children in the early 70s. So this, this can be a, a long war, a long spiritual conflict. And so I want to encourage any mother out there not to give up. Paul, uh, Jesus says in Luke 18, 1, that, that men and women ought always to pray and not lose hope or not give up. So don't give up. Don't give up. I am the I'm the testimony of answered prayer, and what God can do through a praying mom or dad. Amen, uh, Pastor Greg. You uh, mentioned your relationship with your father. Yes, and uh, you mentioned that uh, your brothers and sisters gave their life to Jesus. Your mom gave your life to Je- gave her life to yes. Jesus. What happened with your dad and your relationship with him? God completely healed my relationship. With my parents. In fact, I ended up moving back home for a short time for the express purpose of reconciling with my with my father. And long story made short, my father died in 2010. He was 91 years old. My dad was a very um, devoted Catholic. We had a moment when he was 89 years old. It was in December. We had a moment of really reckoning. And the Holy Spirit opened up his heart. I said, Dad, I said, you're trying to be a good man, and you are, but you're trying to do good works, religious exercises to get you into heaven. I said, we're not saved by good works. The Bible says we're saved by grace. It's a gift. It's not from us. It is the gift of God. The Spirit of God brought conviction, cut his heart. He goes, what what do I do? I said, surrender to Jesus. This is pretty miraculous. And so right there in his living room, we got down on our knees, and I led him to Jesus, and he was born again. Mm -hmm. All the pride, all the religious pride, all that which was really, uh, uh, it was all a barrier to grace. All that was broken. That that self-righteousness was broken off of him. He prayed. He humbled himself. He literally, within two weeks, went to the priest and said, I'm leaving he was at this church for 54 since 1954 and he says i'm leaving i've surrendered my life to jesus and he came to king of the nations mm-hmm. he was in this very building in the front row worshiping the lord on new year's eve i baptized him he's the tallest man i've ever baptized in that baptistry my father was 66 and um he got saved he was faithful he had a hunger to learn the bible it's sad though he was 89 What would have happened if it happened 20, 30, 40 years earlier? He forgave his father. He forgave all the people in his life that that hurt him very deeply. And I watched the Lord tenderize his heart. And the two years that he lived, that man began to grow and soar in his walk with Jesus. So my mom's prayer was answered. And I'll see him when I go to glory. (laughs) 89 years old, baptizing an 89-year-old man. It's absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. Thank you for asking that question. Pastor Greg, who is Jesus to you? I have a, let me just say this. The vision of my life is not 
ministry first, not even marriage or being a father. The most important vision and desire of my life is to be a friend of Jesus. And so for, for 42 years, I've been seeking to build, through the grace of God, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, a friendship with Jesus. So who is he to me? He's my closest friend. I want to be his closest friend. You know, Jesus says in John 15, you are my friends if you do what I say. Obedience is the love language for friendship with God. I'm actually working on a book about friendship with God. It's been a journey. So Jesus, I would say, is not only my Savior and my deliverer, he is my friend. Mm. And he is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I teach uh, here at King of the Nations, um, I teach each person should really, through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, develop a vision for building friendship with God. And the secrets of the Lord belong to those who fear him. And you don't share your secrets with just anybody. You share your secrets with your closest friend. And so we have a God that really wants to share his secrets with us. It's very, very powerful. One of the things that, that really gripped me um, in before I came to Christ was the reality of eternity. I was so afraid of death. And that's one of the reasons why I drank the way I did, because it would, it would help me escape the fear of death. It didn't last very long. And eternity is too long to be wrong. <laughs> and so, man, that fear of death was broken that Sunday morning. Hmm. Never to walk in it again. Never to walk in the fear of death again. And um, how can you walk in the fear of death when you have the Spirit of God living in your heart and you're going to live forever? Pastor, for those who are in, in that same place that you once were where everything is being cut off under them, maybe they're in that place and they don't understand what's happening. It's just everything is against me. Yeah. Nothing is working out. Yeah. I don't know what to do. Maybe I've they've cried out to God and feel like they're not hearing from him or don't even know what his voice sounds like. Mm -hmm. What is a word of encouragement that you can give mm -hmm. uh, now as you've experienced mm -hmm. what it's like to walk with Jesus? What is a word of encouragement that you can give to that person mm -hmm. who is discouraged right now? Well, I would say to this person, uh, you mean the person who doesn't know Jesus hasn't come into a personal relationship with the Lord? Correct. That okay. is struggling. I would, I would say, look at the shaking that's taking place in your life. It's not by accident. And God's intervention is, is really driven by his love and his mercy. I love the streets. I talk to people everywhere I go, no matter where they're from, no matter how old they are, if God opens up the door for me to share with them. And many times I'll look at the person and say, I'm an answer to someone's prayer because that's why we're talking, not that I'm anything. But God sent me to talk to you about you and about him. And so I think sometimes we, we, we you know, in darkness, we, we, don't, we don't decipher what's really going on in our lives. And I would say to the person that is experiencing that shaken, I would say, today's the day of salvation. Don't wait another day. Now is the time. Now is the acceptable time to surrender your life to Jesus. And I, I think we can move in an arrogance. Well, I got many, many years ahead of me. And if, if your life's being shaken, you've lost your job, your marriage is breaking apart, you're, you're in an addiction you can't get out of, man, God is showing you a way out. Jesus is the door. He's called the door in John chapter 10, and he, he wants to be the door of salvation for you. And so today's the acceptable time. I really, really wish I would have surrendered much earlier than I did. I spent seven years in alcohol addiction, went from bad to worse. I really, and he redeems the years the locusts have eaten. He restores those years, mm. but time we can't get back. Yeah. Pastor, for those who are ready to give their life to Jesus, or maybe even rededicate their life to the Lord, could yeah. you just pray for those who are watching on the other side of the screen? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I just want to say that the Spirit of God is right where you are, and He's talking to you today, and He's drawing you. 
and every lie and every, all the schemes of the enemy that have sought to hold you captive in your mind, because that's where the battle is. I'm going to pray that your mind would be loosed from these things so that you can come to Christ, so that you can surrender, so that you can come to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's just pray. Father, in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the power of your son's name. And Father, you know where we are. You know what we're doing. You know what we need. You know our future. And I ask right now, For those that are far, far away from you, for those that are backslidden, for those that are self-condemned and walking in shame and feeling like a prodigal today, I pray, Father, that the manifestation of your power would loose these people in their minds from all demonic oppression and control. I pray, Father, that you would strike the heart with your love, that they would know that they're loved by you today. I pray, Father, for that divine intervention. If you could save me, you can save any Anybody. And I just I just pray, Father, right now for the miracle, the greatest miracle of the new birth to take place in the life of those that are watching. Spirit of God, come and rest upon them. Shake them, shake them, shake them, and bring them to the end of themselves so that they might know your mercy and might know your love and might know your saving grace today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everybody. I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the U.S. right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.